So, hi guys. Uh, today, uh, our speaker is Nathan Moinihan from Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics, University of Edinburgh. And uh, uh, he's going to speak about a massive three-dimensional double copy in this forum. Uh, this is 91st talk in the series. Uh, so talk number 91. So I hope we can learn a lot from Nathan. And uh, this is a collaborative work with two other fellows and based on some of his recent work posted in archive. And uh, thank you Nathan for your contribution in this forum and uh, hope we can learn a lot of things from you because uh, we didn't heard about double copy yet in our forum. So you can start. Okay. okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, so yes, as I said, I'm going to be talking about a three-dimensional uh, massive double copy. Although beforehand, um, since I've been told to try and make this a bit more general, I'm just going to first go over what the double copy is. Um, so the double copy is a relationship between gauge theories and gravity, um, where in some sense you can think of gravity as the square of the gauge theory. So I'm going to make a little bit more precise what that means. Uh, but first, we notice that gauge theories and gravity are not that similar uh, in many ways, although similar in other ways. Um, so, for example, the, the action of Yang Mills uh, just stops at fourth order, um, whereas general relativity has an infinite number of terms. So, in this sense, it's quite hard to see how I can possibly make the claim that one theory is the square of the other theory. Um, however, classically, we do notice that both of them have, for example, uh, similar inverse square laws, where it seems like I can just replace the charges and the masses with uh, each other and find so, the same things. Uh, Nathan, and a question from the previous yeah. slide. Uh, could you please go back a bit? So you have read, yeah. uh, 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 it's a kind of a perturbative action of the Einstein-Hilbert action, where you have taken the, the contribution from the perturbation, uh, means the H mu nu, okay? So I yes, I, I, H mu nu here is the graviton. Yeah, um, and we're just perturbing it around flat space. But each mu nu just represents flat space. So we're just taking the uh, Einstein-Hilbert action, which is just the Ricci yeah. scalar. No, uh, my my question the, is: This is an, a kind of an infinite expansion in kappa. So uh, where to stop actually? Where? To uh, so there is no place to stop naturally. Right. Um, I mean, that's why I just put plus dot 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 because there's going to be an infinite number of high order uh, terms. I mean, if you think about this in terms of a, a Feynman diagram expansion, you're going to have uh, three point plus four point plus plus dot 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 just forever. Right? Yes. Um, so there is no natural stopping. But, but as we'll see, there is a, a, a way. Uh, there are solutions to the equations of motion where, in fact, this expansion is completely finite, and we will see those uh, in so, a few slides. So the diagram that you have written, these are basically the contact diagrams. So what about the exchanges and all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So those are all in there as well. I mean, I should just put blobs. Uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Right. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you build those out of all the different diagrams that you can get. Yeah. Okay. You proceed. Okay. Um, so there's also some uh, evidence that comes from string theory in the sense that in string theory, gravity is described by closed strings and gauge theories are described by open strings with uh, boundary conditions. So in some sense, if you, it, it seems completely obvious that if you take two open strings and you glue them together, you get a closed string. Uh, and actually, this can be made very formal in string theory with something called the KLT relations, where they show you how to take 
open string scattering amplitudes and turn them into closed string scattering amplitudes. When you take uh, alpha prime to zero in string theory, you should get some kind of quantum field theory. And this tells you that in quantum field theory, there should be some relationship between um, scattering amplitudes in gravity and scattering amplitudes in gauge theory. So this is a, a good suggestive uh, idea. And that, that's what we call the double copy. The problem is when you when you try and build scattering amplitudes in gravity, well, the final well, rules and another are question. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. When you uh, consider alpha prime, that means it's a the tension is very high. Okay, so right. so uh, I can understand that it's basically kind of some uh, you considering alpha prime to be very small or something like that. But why you are calling that to be a uh, uh, double copy in the classical regime? Uh, is there well, is there I'm, I'm, I'm more suggesting that you have this relationship between open strings and closed strings and string theory. Okay. And you have a field theory limit of string theory that you can take. So if you've got a relationship there in the string theory and you can take a field theory limit, maybe there's a relationship between the field theories as well. Okay. So I'm just saying it's suggestive that there's a, a similar kind of relationship in field theory. And okay. if we discover such a thing, that's going to be the double copy. So we'll, we'll see that. Okay, you press. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so if you want to just understand um, how to compute scattering amplitudes, what you do is you uh, compute the vertices. Um, so for example, you compute D, S, D, H, mu, nu, H, blah, 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 with a bunch of indices, and you're going to get this thing, which is the, the three-point vertex in general relativity. Now, this thing, as we uh, might have guessed looking at the perturbative expansion, this thing has, I claim, uh, 168 terms, at least in this sort of language. But then you compare that with the gauge theory three-particle vertex, and it only has six terms. So this is again suggests that even the scattering amplitudes don't seem like they ought to double copy, at least in the field theory sense, at least not obvious. However, as soon as we look at this on shell, where we consider uh, the momenta p squared of all the legs to be zero, or k squared, as I wrote in the last slide, um, then we find, in fact, at the three particle level, at least, we get an exact double copy. The, the uh, amplitude of three gluons squares exactly to give the amplitude of three gravitons. And in fact, if we decide to replace two of the gluon legs or graviton legs with matter particles, say, you know, these could be uh, scalars or fermions or whatever, then this also, generally speaking, uh, holds. And is in fact true in any number of dimensions, and uh, uh, as is this statement. Um, things get more interesting when you want to look at, say, four particle amplitudes or, or higher, higher point amplitudes in general. One question again. Yeah. For, for graviton, the, there are two polarizations we know. Yeah. Okay. So, right. uh, and we call it a spin two object. But one, once you consider gluon, which is a kind of a uh, some gauge field or something like that, uh, mm -hmm. which is participating in the strong interaction, so the helicity degrees of freedom or maybe the polarization are the same with the exactly gra graviton. Uh, well, the, the gluon polarization vectors. Uh, I mean, gluons are spin one, so. In that sense, what I'm saying is we're going to take uh, uh, a graviton polarization tensor, mm -hmm. which has two. And what we want to be able to do is write this as uh, a polarization vector of a of two gluons. So let's say say I take a negative helicity spin through particle. I can write that as the product of two negative helicity uh, gluon polarization vectors. Okay. 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 So in gauge theories, we compute scattering amplitudes. And 
they generically will have this form. So this is some kind of coupling constant. Um, these ni's here are numerators that contain all of the kinematic information. So uh, pi dot epsilon j, uh, where epsilon is the um, is this guy, the polarization vector, uh, pi dot pj, these sorts of things. Um, S are typically Mandelstam variables or just propagators uh, in general. And the CIs, engage theories, are contain all of the uh, gauge group information, all of the color information. So we might think of some SUN gauge theory. And these guys will satisfy these Jacobi relations. So for example, if you had a four particle amplitude, these Cs might be something like F, A, B, C, F, C, D, E, for example, right? Where A, B, and D, E represent the colors of the external uh, gluons that are participating in the, in the interaction. Um, and then these will obviously be summed over in different ways to represent all of the different channels uh, in the amplitude. Now, the claim made by Bernd, Carrasco, and Johansson um, is that you can always write this guy um, in such a way that the kinematic factors um, kind of inherit the same symmetry properties as the uh, color factors. Now, if you can do this, um, then it turns out that the double copy is simply a case of replacing the color factors with uh, a kinematic factor. And, okay, I should probably have written a different uh, coupling constant here, because obviously we need to replace this with the gravitational coupling constant, but okay, I say we do that here. Um, and it turns out that this guy is, at least at tree level, I should say, is always some kind of gravitational amplitude. So all you do is you uh, replace the color factors with a kinematic factor, I should say as well that this kinematic factor does not have to be a kinematic factor from the same theory. In principle, you can have two different theories and you still get interesting results. And there's lots of interesting work on that. Um, and you replace the ends with um, essentially the charges, right? So any, any masses. Um, and at tree level, this is exactly the equivalent thing to the uh, KLT relations. So the thing that Sainz asked about before about um, the, the results from string theory and the results from field theory. This is the field theory equivalent of that. Uh, and essentially the takeaway is that gravity amplitudes can in fact be written as the square of gauge theory amplitudes, at least in the pure case. Okay. But if amplitudes double copy uh, and tree level amplitudes in some sense are um, solutions to the equations of motion, this suggests that there are other classical solutions. Um, so you asked the interesting question before, at what order in the Einstein-Hilbert action do we stop if uh, we write it as a perturbative series? Typically, the answer is never. It just goes on forever. It's an infinite series. Um, however, we can make a special choice of graviton, h mu nu, such that we can, in fact, make the action completely finite. And that choice is to choose h mu nu equal to k mu k mu phi, where these k mu's are null vectors that satisfy these properties. And in some, in some cases, you can um, solve Einstein's equations uh, exactly, not perturbatively now, exactly, um, by plugging in these k's. And you can then ask, is k mu, with some modifications perhaps, uh, a solution to the um, Yang-Mills equations of motion, right? Um, and that would be the classical equivalent of the double copy, at least in this very special case that we're looking at here, right? And in some cases, this is true. And these people have uh, done lots of excellent work to show that um, you can indeed relate classical solutions in gravity and classical solutions in 
Yang Mills and Maxwell electrodynamics uh, by writing what is called the single copy. So let's look at an example. So one example is uh, uh, the black hole solution that everyone will know. Um, that has this form where k nu uh, is now this null vector. And if you just follow the double copy prescription that I laid out earlier and you write a nu as uh, this stuff, you replace m with q, you replace the couplings, etc. you'll find this guy. This doesn't much look like any solution that I know of. Uh, however, if you do this gauge transformation, then you find a gauge field that looks like this. And this is exactly the gauge field that represents a Coulomb charge. I mean, well, they both are. Um, this one just has a more familiar form. Um, and this tells us that the black hole solution is merely the square of an individual Coulomb charge uh, in, in the classical sense. Alternatively, we can try and compute classical observables uh, directly from scattering amplitudes. So scattering amplitudes, typically, you know, if you open Peskin and Schroeder or something, you'll see it's a, an expansion in terms of H bar. But in some sense, we should be able to take an H bar goes to zero limit and find classical only observables that we can compute from these scattering amplitudes, kind of as the limit of uh, quantum field theory basically classical field theory observables from quantum field theory. So one such observable is uh, the impulse, or well, the classical impulse is what I'm really going to look at. And the, the impulse is just the change in momentum as the result of some uh, interaction, right? So for example, in electromagnetism, uh, you might have the interaction of you might think about a, a particle traveling in the background of a classical, you know, some classical charge object, um, which generates uh, an electromagnetic field, which is governed by F mu nu. And you want to ask what the change in momentum is, and this is the way you do it, right? So you do it from the classical equations of motion. So you, you plug in an F mu nu for some particular situation, and you do this integration, and you'll find out what the change in momentum is. Um, then a very nice paper, Kosawa, maybe, and O'Connell showed that, in fact, you can relate this quantity in the H bar goes to zero limit um, to this two to two conservative amplitude. So when I say two to two conservative amplitude, what I mean is you have some heavy uh, charged objects, let's say, I mean, this is very general. You just have some heavy object that doesn't really move and you scatter a particle of it and uh, you, you have two incoming particles and two outgoing, outgoing particles. Um, and in this way, you can find, for example, that the impulse calculated uh, for a rotating black hole is related by the double copy to the impulse calculated from a rotating charged particle. Okay. So if we have things like scattering amplitudes, uh, double copying, the three particle double amplitude double copies, etc., then surely the propagator should double copy as well. Um, well, the photon propagator, uh, up to facts of Q squared, is basically just given by eating mu nu. But the graviton propagator is much more complicated and clearly uh, this, this is not the square of this, right? Um, so what's going on? Well, the solution is to include a coupling to magnetic monopoles. Um, so in 1965, Weinberg wrote down this propagator, although it wasn't quite in this form, but he wrote down this propagator. And essentially that comes from in including a contribution from the dual field strength. So, you, you, you know, un under electromagnetic duality, uh, this is what this looks like. And- So, Nathan, I just have a very yeah. basic question. Maybe you will smile after listening this. So all this prescription work in B greater than three, 
Sorry, say that again. This prescription works for dimension greater than three. Um, yes. Um, well, this this particular thing is only valid in four dimensions. Um, for example, the three particle double copy is valid in any number of dimensions greater than three. Yeah, uh, why I have asked because in two dimension or maybe three dimension, you don't consider gravity to be a dynamical object. Or right, things get a lot more complicated if you ask about say one plus one dimensions. Yeah. Um, probably you need to consider scalar tensor type things like JT gravity or something because there isn't really a notion of scattering. Um, although as we'll see, um, you, there is notions of purely topological scattering in lower dimensions, and in fact, there's there's ways to think about the double copy there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have an example in a minute. Okay, Maybe thank you. Then sure. Um, okay, so it turns out that this guy does double copy to exactly give you the graviton propagator in four dimensions. At least the real part does. Uh, if you include both parts, then you'll find the equivalent of this, which is the uh, dual graviton that you get from dualizing the Riemann tensor. But that's a little bit beyond this uh, talk. Um, so one interesting observation that you can make <clears throat> is that for massive gravitons, um, the form of the propagator only changes by this in the sense that uh, this factor is d minus two for massless gravitons and d minus one for massive gravitons. And what this means is that the 4D massless propagator is identical to the 3D massive propagator, at least when you consider contracting it with conserved currents. Um, and that means that it must also double copy in some way. But now we need the Levi-Civita in three dimensions necessarily only has three indices, right? And on dimensional grounds, we need something with a mass to uh, for this for this factor to work. Um, oh, sorry, I should have said p mu is okay. So we, we can just think of this as e to mu uh, for now. Um, this is precisely the propagator for topologically massive gauge theory. Uh, so now the natural question to ask, does topologically massive gauge theory double copy to topologically massive gravity? Should note that in four dimensions, um, the double copy fails for massive fields. As in, if you take massive Yang mills uh, and you try and square it into massive gravity, you find that it works up to four point level, but then at five point it fails. And that was shown in a very nice paper uh, by these people. Okay, so what is a topologically massive gauge theory? So a topologically massive gauge theory is a, a theory where you have particles which you typically think of as being massless in uh, four dimensions, so but you can generate mass by introducing a, a topological term like this. Yes. So happen, this is kind of uh, the uh, w like one to one correspondence between the gravitational Chan Simons theory with the uh, matter Chan Simons theory kind of thing. Is it like that? Uh, yeah, so basically, um, th this is the Chan Simons uh, action, if you like. Yeah. Just this piece. And you might couple matter to this and get Chan Simons matter. Uh, topologically massive gauge theories just mean that you include a free Maxwell part. Yes. And together, these guys give you a massive, uh, let's say, gluon, you can have topologically massive angles or topologically massive electrodynamics or something like that. But yeah, if you couple matter to these guys, let's say you, you, had a, you added a, I don't know, a fermion term with some current uh, couple to, you, you would then be coupling to a churn simons gauge field now if you're using churn simons matter. And yes, this would just be the gravitational equivalent of that, yeah. Cool. Um, so roughly speaking, this is the kinetic term for uh, 
just a you know, usual gauge field. Uh, this guy is the Chern Simons part, which is in four dimensions is uh, a boundary term that you get and it's purely topological, hence the name topologically massive gravity, uh, topologically massive gauge theory. Um, and this is basically the completely equivalent gravitational theory where the gauge fields are just replaced by um, Christoffel symbols and the kinetic term is uh, just replaced by the Ricci scalar. Now, each action describes massive particles where their spins are uh, proportional to these masses here. Um, and they're completely gauge invariant. So normally when you add mass to theories, you break gauge invariance, um, which is problematic, which is why things like the Higgs mechanism exists, etc. This is an alternative way of giving mass to particles without breaking gauge invariance, because it turns out that these two terms are completely gauge invariant. Well, they're mostly gauge invariant. Okay, they're, they're, they're gauge invariant. For our purposes, they're gauge invariant. Um, so when you couple, um, under electric magnetic duality, when you couple uh, a gauge field to one of these magnetic terms in the propagator, you get a parity violating theory and any particle, any matter particles that you couple become um, dions. So they get charged with both an electric charge and a magnetic charge. So dion is a, a, an object with both of those things. So now we can ask the question, what happens when we, when we uh, couple to a Chern-Simons term and a Maxwell kinetic term? The answer is that the particles uh, are anions. Um, so anions are these quasi-particles in two plus one dimensions. Uh, they only exist in two plus one dimensions. They have, they have electric charge, but they also have magnetic flux. So you can think of them as having a kind of, uh, you can think of a two dimensional plane with a particle in the middle, which has some charge. And then there's kind of a line that comes out of the plane, which is the magnetic flux that goes through it. Um, and most interestingly, they obey anionic statistics. So we all know that, um, you know, bosons, when you exchange them, uh, don't pick up a sign, and fermions, when you exchange them, pick up a, a minus one. Well, anion can pick up any phase possible. So this theta here would be 2 pi in some cases, pi in some cases for normal particles, but for anions, it can be literally absolutely anything. Um, now, we want to think about scattering apogees involving these guys, because as we, as I explained earlier, scattering amplitudes are the natural place to look for the double copy. Um, so let's scatter these guys and see what happens. Now, in scattering amplitudes in the modern language are uh, typically written as in what is called spinner helicity variables. The reason why this is good is because um, Momentum variables are not very well adapted to the properties of scattering amplitudes. So one of the interesting properties of scattering amplitudes is how they transform under the little group. So the little group is um, basically a, a, a subgroup of the Lorentz group that leaves a particular momentum unchanged. So you might think about a particle traveling along um, Z, let's say, and if it's a massless particle traveling along Z, um, it's going to have two components of that four component vector. And that means that you can freely rotate in the XY plane without doing anything to that uh, momentum. So we say that the little group is SO2, two dimensional rotations. Right? Uh, for a massive particle, you can look in the rest frame of that particle. It only has one component, so you can do fully three-dimensional rotations and nothing will happen to the momentum of that particle. So the little group is three-dimensional rotations. Um, 
these particular variables make that manifest. So the starting point is that you notice that you can always rewrite um, momentum vectors in as matrices um, where you replace the Lorentz four vector index with two spinner indices. Um, so these are SL2 indices, you know, they're chiral uh, indices. And momentum is now, oh, well, a given momentum is now represented by this matrix. Um, if this is a null vector, that translates to the determinant of this guy being zero. And that means that we can, we can write any uh, matrix with determinant zero as the outer product of two vectors. And these vectors, or in fact, they're spinners, because they're two by one vectors, um, one for each chirality. Um, and for massive particles, where the determinant is not zero, we can write this as the sum of the outer product of two vectors. And that's exactly what these guys did here, where now the i's and j's here are little group indices. So you can think about them as rote, you know, indices that you might rotate in two dimensions, three dimensions, sorry. So they're SU2 little group indices. And we're gonna use this bold notation, which just means that if you contract to any two of these lambdas together, we're not gonna bother carrying around these i's and j's. Um, we're just gonna use this bold notation where i and j is assumed to be there because we can always put them back later because you, the i's and j's need to be just completely symmetric uh, in any amplitude or whatever that we have. So we can always just put them back if we need to. Another question. So why uh, in yeah. this notation, this alpha dot is used? Because usually sometimes once we think of supersymmetries, there we can uh, use this kind of notation. It, this is nothing to do with supersymmetry or nothing. So why like, uh, is this? this uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's to just uh, talk about chirality, basically. Yeah. So the Lorentz, the Lorentz group separates into left and right chiral SL2 sectors. So the alpha dot is for, let's say, the right chiral and the alpha is on the left. That's all okay, is. okay. The two chiral sectors are differentiated like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so the reason that we do this is because we know how scattering amplitudes um, are, how they have to behave under little group transformations. So specifically, amplitudes with uh, spin s external particles, um, I just told you that you, you should be able to rotate them in, in particular ways. Therefore, they need to have enough indices for you to be able to do that. So amplitudes in our objects with two s symmetric indices, i, j, k, l, blah, 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 which as I said, we will just suppress in favor of this bold notation. Um, and doing this essentially allows us to write amplitudes down uh, kind of immediately without having to bother with Feynman rules and stuff like that. So for example, um, let's imagine that we have two spin s particles. Well, we have one spin s particle that's emitting a photon, let's say, right? Or, or a massless particle of velocity h. We know that the incoming particle should have uh, 2s indices associated to its momentum, and the outgoing particle should also have 2s indices uh, associated to its momentum, and that the massless particle must have some object that contains its helicity, but it, it has no indices because its little group is uh, u1, so it's not massive, right? So Using that information alone and dimensional analysis, we know that we have to have 2s uh, spinner helicity variables corresponding to momentum one, 2s spinner helicity variables corresponding to momentum two. We need this thing to have the right mass dimension, so we 
put some masses in the denominator, and then this x here is the thing that just carries all the electricity information of the massless particle. And we know that we have to have it in this form because we need it to be Lorentz invariant. There shouldn't be any alphas and alpha dots knocking around. And this is essentially the only thing that we can write down, right? Um, right. When we want to find four particle amplitudes, we take these guys and we sum over the internal helicities, assuming that we're gluing them together with uh, these x's. And we can write a four particle amplitude by just summing over the helicities according to the optical theorem or whatever. Um, okay, so that's going to be, I mean, that's the, that's the general game plan that you have in four dimensions. In three dimensions, um, things are a bit different. So, the Lorentz group is now, um, well, so the Lorentz group in, in three dimensions is SO2, comma 1, and actually there's, it's uh, isomorphic to many other things. We're going to specifically look at SU1, comma 1 for our purposes. So in 4D, you remember that we had uh, this representation for the momentum. Um, but in 3D, you don't have these left and right chiral sectors. They're just completely equivalent. So there are no dotted indices in two plus one dimensions. So you might look at this and say, well, I can build a three dimensional uh, momentum by just symmetrizing this guy, right? Because if you symmetrize this guy, you're gonna get rid of momentum P2. You're gonna end up with something that's nice and real. Um, and the only problem is that you've got this annoying dotted indices that you've got to worry about, but maybe you just say, well, I'll just change it to a B, doesn't really matter. So if you do that, and that's actually a perfectly fine strategy, what you'll find is that you'll get an SL2R representation, um, which is perfectly fine for some purposes, but for our purposes, SU1, comma one is a more convenient representation. So what you do instead is you project out along the Z axis, um, and you do some kind of dimensional reduction where your z-axis now becomes the mass. Uh, this operator here uh, is exactly what projects out the z, the, the z component of your momentum. And it also happens to um, convert a dotted index into an undotted index. So this looks exactly like the kind of guy that we want to use. And in fact, if you take a 4D momentum or 4D momentum matrix, uh, and you, you act on it with this, with this guy, you exactly project out the, the, the Z component. And then we're just gonna call that Z component minus M. And we're gonna call this thing the three-dimensional uh, momentum now, right? And we're gonna do exactly as we did before. And we're gonna write it as lambdas with little group indices and all this stuff, and we're going to use it to build our amplitudes. So these are exactly related to the uh, to the four dimensional guys that we, that we had earlier. Where now the the lambdas just remain unchanged, whereas the lambda tilts now get acted on by this operator that essentially converts them from four dimensional uh, spinners to three dimensional spinners. And of course, what I should have written here is also P3 goes to minus M, which I forgot to write. So obviously you have to change all the P3s to, to minus M as well, if there are any. Um, and this essentially means that the amplitudes remain completely unchanged. The amplitudes that I wrote down earlier, and the, the three particle amplitudes. Um, and in fact, these X's that we saw in the amplitudes before, which carried the helicity information, um, this is what you, what you have in four dimensions. And in fact, in three dimensions, we can just write it down exactly by, by acting with this uh, chi operator. And we find that the three amplitudes that I wrote down before is exactly the same, but now we just replace the X with this new capital X, which is just the three dimensional version. Okay, so I wrote down these three particle amplitudes before, and I said that we, we got there by just considering uh, the properties of scattering amplitudes. So 
how they transform under the little group, um, mass dimension, coupling, that sort of stuff, right? But of course, um, amplitudes are not observables, right? You need to, you know, an observable is something like a cross section, the square of the amplitude, or uh, the impulse formula that I wrote down, that's an observable, but the actual um, amplitudes themselves are not. So there's no particular reason why I can't write down some sort of phase. So for example, the cross section, which is just the, the absolute square of the amplitude, it is completely uh, invariant to me writing down, uh, to me deforming it with a phase. So let's do that. Let's deform it with some phase. And uh, I've deformed it with a phase which is proportional to its helicity uh, for good reason. So when you do this, if you choose theta to just be a, a constant, you change the four particle amplitude, uh, you pick up this extra term, right? So this extra term is, is exactly. Yeah, I guess maybe. Oh, he's back now. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so I put this star here um, because it turns out that this is not strictly speaking uh, true. You actually have to introduce a massive particle with a regulator and then take the regulator mass to zero, and then you'll see this thing. Uh, so actually, the way we do it in our paper is to is to simply uh, start with a um, parity violating theory from the start. So we don't sum over the helicities. We just pick a fixed helicity uh, for our transfer momentum, and then you and then you just see this automatically. Okay. The other thing we can do is we can do a spin deformation. So that is where we choose this, this uh, phase by um, to be something to do with angular momentum. So in this case, we choose uh, a vector, well, in four dimensions, I should say, we choose uh, a spin vector, a mu, which is roughly speaking uh, related to the pauli lebansky uh, pseudo vector. And we dot it with the transfer momentum. And we find that this is equivalent to something known as the, the Janus-Newman shift, which basically um, is a, a result from classical gravity that relates a uh, Schwarzschild black hole solution to a Kerr black hole solution by doing this kind of complex deformation. And in scattering amplitude language, um, doing an exponential shift of e to the a dot q on the three particle amplitudes is exactly what gives you this. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk to go into it, but the reason I bring it up is because we're going to be interested in what happens in three dimensions. And in three dimensions, the pauli lebansky vector is replaced by a pauli lebansky scalar, or actually a pseudo-scalar. Um, so spin is characterized. Well, it turns out, and you can look at our paper for the very long derivation, but it turns out that this is the correct factor to deform the amplitude supply. Um, if you want to understand spin or angular momentum. Okay, so we want to look at the classical double copy. So the way to do that, as I alluded to before with lots of hand waving, is um, we want to consider some uh, heavy source um with mass m2 um with a bit be charged whatever well we want to consider this to be a classical anion so it will have uh, electric charge and magnetic flux and then we're just going to send a pro particle uh into this background uh to see what results we get so the scattering amplitude as i said before is computed by uh 
taking two three particle amplitudes. Uh, so normally we would sum these over the helicity of the internal particle. But as I said before, in this case, we're considering a parity violating theory. So we just pick it given um, so what we do is we consider, you know, a, a positive helicity guy, for example. Um, and because we've given particle two spin, it's it's got this extra factor on it. Um, and then we just smash these guys together and we get an amplitude of this form. So given the expression that I wrote down earlier for the for x1 or for x, we now need to just uh, plug in x1 and x2, and then we can compute this impulse using this formula that uh, was handedly given us to, our, to us by Kossel and maybe in O'Connell. Um, but before we do that, let's compute it using the equations of motion. So if we consider a point source at the origin um, that's rotating with some angular momentum, um, then this is the current that we plug in. So this is, this is telling you that it's r equals zero. This is the part with the angular momentum. Um, and you can just use this to solve for this guy, right? So after some algebra, you find out that the momentum space version of this uh, is just this guy. And you can plug this in um, and find and find that this is the uh, classical impulse that you would compute from the equations of motion. From the amplitude side, as I said, we need to compute x1 over x2. And after lots of tedious algebra, this is what you get. Um, and we plug this into the amplitude in the small mass limit because we want to consider long range scattering, which means the transfer momentum has to be soft. Um, and we find exactly the same thing as in the, the uh, classical equations motion case, except now we have to identify this G here as being sigma over M2, and this G is being, sorry, E squared sigma over M2, and this other G is just being E squared. Um, okay. Before we move on to gravity, um, I want to go back to something that um, Sandstein asked earlier, which is about the fact that in lower dimensions, gravity becomes either trivial or topological or something like that, right? So you think about gravity being completely topological. So we can consider the idea that we've got completely flat space with a single point at the origin and it's been removed, which gives us a conical singularity, right? So even in this situation, where there are no gravitons at all, you find that there is in fact scattering. So if you just take this guy, you plug it into Einstein's equations, you solve for h mu nu in momentum space after perturbing the metric, etc. cetera, um, you'll find that you get this solution. And we can plug this guy into the impulse and the impulse, the equations of motion are basically just this, this is just the geodesic equation. Um, in, in terms of this uh, perturbative graviton. We can plug this guy in and we'll find that we, we do actually get a non-zero um, impulse. And this, is, this means that it must be purely topological because there's flat space absolutely everywhere except at this one point. And we're actually considering being far away from that point. Um, now, importantly, so this W here is the rapidity, right? So if we want to consider two static objects, um, then we'd have to consider rapidity zero. So if we wanted to look at the Newtonian potential, we'd consider rapidity zero, but actually this guy is zero for rapidity zero, um, which is good because Newton tells us that there is no such thing as a gravitational potential in two plus one dimensions, but there is scattered, topological scattering. Okay, so now anions, um, 
have this gravitational counterpart, right? Um, the equations of motion, well, this is the equivalent of, the, of Einstein's equations, but for the anion system, for topologically massive gravity, right? Well, these are the equations of motion for topologically massive gravity, and this is what we're going to be considering as our source. So this is the equivalent of the equations of motion that we had for F mu nu in the last slide. So we're again considering a rotating point mass at the origin. Um, and you can again just solve for H mu nu. And we find this fairly unwieldy looking uh, solution, where now this is a Bessel function. This Y is a Bessel function that you see here and here. And these Cs are just uh, this logarithm. And we can do what we did in the last case, in the topological case, and just plug this guy into this equation and compute the impulse. And we find this fairly uh, interesting looking solution. One thing to note is that by design uh, in topological mass when gravity, you, when you take m goes to infinity, you're supposed to reproduce um, this topological solution, right? So if we take the mass of the graviton to be, to be infinitely heavy, that means that there are no gravitons anymore, or there are no gravitons moving because they're infinitely heavy, nothing couples to it. And you find that you exactly recover this, uh, this topological term, this topological impulse that we found before, except now there's a, there, it's got a different sign. And that's actually because in topologically massive gravity, the sign of the kinetic term is reversed in the action. So this is, this is consistent. Now the question is, given the impulse that we derived before in the electromagnetic case, can we just double copy it and recover this impulse. So by double copying the uh, amplitude that we, that we had in the last case, we follow the prescription and take, uh, replace the couplings. Uh, we square these X ratios and we plug everything in. And so we plug this into this formula that was given to us before. And we'll find that um, we get almost the correct answer, but we're missing this factor of two on this last term, right? So for example, the infinite mass limit of this guy is gonna give us half the result that we had before, right? That's not the most interesting part of the story, however. So, okay, we take the mass to infinity, we get a slightly different result because we're missing a factor of a half. But that doesn't really matter because we can just rescale our coupling constant it's kind of fine. Um, M goes to zero, however, is a different beast. So if you look at the topologically massive gravity action, it actually comes with a one over mass term. So it looks like it's divergent if you take M goes to infinity, uh, sorry, M goes to zero. So you might think that that's not a good uh, idea. However, from a scattering amplitude perspective, there's absolutely no reason uh, why you wouldn't just take the mass to be zero. It's a perfectly sensible question to ask. And in fact, um, a, a paper by these guys shows that there is such a thing as a classical double copy in two plus one dimensions um, in, in the mass, uh, for, for massless particles. Um, so really what we should expect is that whatever double copy have just worked out, if we take the mass to zero, we should recover their solution, right? So I've condensed uh, both solutions, one coming from the classical equations of motion, one coming from the double copy. I've, con I've condensed it into this, where this integration here kind of hides all the delta functions and all the other stuff. And this N here, represents either the solution that we got from double copying the scattering amplitudes or the solution that we got from computing it from the equations of motion, where n equals one gives you the double copy version and n equals two gives you the uh, equations of motion classical calculation. So it turns out that 
in the massless limit, the thing that you end up with is cosh squared W uh, over Q squared here, which is exactly what you expect from the double copy, right? That's exactly what you expect from the double copy of a massless amplitude. It's what you get in, in, in four dimensions as well. So that's maybe not that surprising. Um, for n equals two, what we find is that we just get that this whole thing just becomes one, and we just get q mu over q squared, which is exactly what you you would get if you were uh, exchanging a dilaton and not a graviton. So, what this cos squared w is is a combination of a dilaton and a graviton being exchanged, and in the in the classical equations of motion sense, you just get uh, a dilaton. So if you look at the propagator for topologically massive gravity, it contains uh, a ghost term, which actually reduces to a dilaton in the massless limit. You can question whether or not it's sensible to take the massless limit, but again, from the perspective of the scattering amplitudes, there's no reason not to, so we might as well. Um, but what this tells us is that the double copy somehow contains an extra massless graviton in its spectrum to give rise to this uh, cosh squared piece, which is kind of surprising, but also possibly not that surprising when you consider the fact that uh, the double copy doesn't just relate pure yang mills with pure gravity. Uh, science, I asked earlier about the polarizations of gravitons being spin two and, and gluons being spin one. Of course, you can. There's many ways that you can combine two spin one polarization vectors. Right? You can combine minus minus to get a minus helicity graviton. You can combine plus plus to get a plus helicity graviton. But you can also combine minus plus and plus minus. And these must give you scalars, but scalars that are now somehow involved with gravity. And the dilaton is a, the obvious candidate for that. Right? So this this mixing is maybe not so surprising from that perspective. Okay, uh, the last thing I want to talk about is one of the kind of defining features of, of anions, which is that they, they give rise to this phase, as I said at the beginning of the, of the talk. Um, so an interesting result of quantum mechanics is that the vector potential is a real thing that can actually give rise to uh, interesting observables. The, the kind of um, standard one being the Aronoff bone effect. Um, so it's defined as being a phase that you get from uh, having a closed loop go around a um, the, the gauge potential that you would get, or the vector potential. And what we can do is we can we can extract this vector potential directly from the on-shell scattering amplitudes um, in the Born approximation, and we can derive this interesting result. So this is this is in in generally uh, in, in d dimensions, and in three dimensions um, we get this thing, and we can just plug in uh, our amplitude that we've uh, that we previously derived and see what happens. So if we plug this in and we take uh, so because we because the Aronoff bone effect is a purely topological effect, we don't want uh, particles. We, we don't want other couplings running around. So we take E goes to it, we take the charge goes to infinity and the mass goes to infinity, leaving the ratio between them to be finite. And we find that we exactly get uh, E squared over M as being this um, Aronoff bone phase. This is, exactly agrees with the literature. And in fact, we can use uh, the relationship that I started this talk with, which is just the uh, double copy, where we take the coupling to be kappa m, and we find exactly that we get the gravitational Aronoff bone effect, which you also find in the in in, in this paper, for example. And you find that this exactly agrees, and once again, the double copy um, has proven itself to be useful. And with that. Thank you very much for listening and ask if there are any questions. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, if there is a question, guys, please ask. And before that, I will ask uh, everyone to unmute and give a clap for him.
Uh, yeah. So, uh, guys, you guys can ask questions. I, I, I want to ask one question. Uh, <clears throat> since you talked about the three dimensional picture, so particularly for anions, there is a quantity called holonomy. So how holonomy yeah. plays important role in uh, the scattering amplitudes? So the holonomy is essentially what gives rise to the animal phone place. Yeah. So, um, Essentially, there's this anion foam scattering that you can do, which is actually have a, a first look at it, where um, you're thinking now in terms of maybe partial wave scattering and thinking about wave functions. Um, what we were doing here is essentially showing that you can recover the same information by not thinking about wave functions or whatever at all, and just thinking about on-shell scattering amplitudes um, that you build from, you know, little group dimensional analysis, unitarity, etc. Um, and we can we can reconstruct what is essentially the information that you would get from the whole. Yeah. Yeah. So why I have particularly asked because there is an equivalent prescription by Spenta Vadia, Shiraz Minwala, and a lot of people have and Sachin Jain, people have actually computed different scattering amplitudes for chance elements matter theories in three dimensions. So they usually follow this uh, approach if there is a holonomy and then how to translate the whole problem in that language and finding the scattering amplitude from out of that. That's why I have actually asked that question. Okay, that's interesting. I'll, I'll have to look at that. Because, because these work, this is kind of a uh, scattering amplitude program which started uh, uh, in 2008, seven, eight and people are working on that many works people have done i've, I've read some i've read some of these papers uh, yeah. so they, 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 those guys are typically looking at um just then simon maths right so they don't have what well essentially the difference is they don't have this kinetic uh part no i i can understand uh, i'm just saying that yeah like the similar kind of thing they did they they just did. yeah 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 they, they've done some very interesting work yeah some of that. So their analysis in the flat space, even uh, it's like Chan Simon's matter theory in three dimension flat space. What could we yeah. do? Uh, so, and yeah, many many things they actually have studied like bosonization, um, a lot of things. Recently, they actually uh, uh, presented one work at strings as well. So that's why I have pointed about. Mm. Uh, my, my, my second question was regarding, oh, okay. So since I found that you have a, a lot of classical analog, so did you have any uh, future pro, uh, uh, direction or uh, anything in your mind to correct, uh, connect with this LIGO uh, gravitational wave observation from the black hole merger problems because they are also doing this kind of scattering amplitude program. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of interesting things that can be computed from scattering amplitudes. Uh, for example, yeah. you know, I didn't write the formula down, but there's a very similar formula for uh, radiated momentum, for example, right? So, it's entirely conceivable to, to think about how you would compute classical radiation from the scattering amplitude. And in fact, there's a number of people uh, that have written some very nice papers on that. and uh, yeah, I'm currently working on some stuff about that as well. It would be interesting to see if there's any kind of two plus one dimensional analog uh, in, in massive gravity with that. Uh, I, I suspect probably there is. Um, there's no particular reason to assume that it, it, everything that works in four dimensions wouldn't come out basically the same in two plus one dimensions with, you know, certain caveats. Um, I'm not sure it would be of any practical value in terms of the LIGO experiment, however. So, uh, well, I'm just asking. Yeah. You. So, the other guy, you will you can ask question if you have anything. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't have any questions at this time. Thanks. But yeah, it was a great talk. Thanks, Nathan. Excellent.
Okay, so I think there is no question. So thank you, Nathan, for your contribution. This talk will be posted in YouTube. And once this will share in my channel, I will share the link with you. And stay safe and healthy. And uh, maybe we can see you with some of your new future works and ideas in uh, again in our forum in near future or sometime. And uh, thank you. Uh, bye. Yeah, I'll come back. <laughs> yes. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pei. Bye. <laughs>